Okay, folks, uh, let's get started. Um, as always, I want to start with some reminders and such things. Um, and very simple reminder, there's a homework that's few, but uh, more importantly, I don't know what's going on with the screen. Can people on Zoom see any change in the screen in your display? Okay, yeah. so yeah, there's a homework that's due tomorrow. Uh, it, in my mind, was due today, but apparently I can't tell, uh, read a calendar. So you have an extra day. Um, it's due, yes. Am I recording? I'm not recording. Thank you. I am recording. Uh, yes, I'm recording. So uh, the homework's due tomorrow, midnight. And uh, in case you haven't started already, I highly encourage that you start maybe after class. It might keep you busy for the next two days. Um, if you haven't uh, attended office hours, um, again, I encourage you to attend office hours. Uh, there's one right after class today uh, with me, and then there's one tomorrow with Maitre, right? Uh, no, tomorrow. tomorrow is Ashim uh, at, I think, noon. I think that'll be on Zoom, uh, just like last week. There's a question. What do you recommend if you have class during all of the office hours? Every single one of them. I draw, uh, send uh, an email to the TAs if any of the TAs can manage it. Uh, unfortunately, I can't move my office hours because this is literally the only time I have. Uh, are there many people with conflicts during the office hours? During all of them? Just you? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> are you sure you're in the right classes? Okay. Um, and do use Canvas for discussion. Um, there's a lot of uh, chat on Canvas about the homework already. Maybe, uh, you know, you, you uh, see if your question's already answered. If not, uh, make a post. One of us will get to it whenever we can. Uh, the original plan was uh, for homework two to be released today so that I don't give you a single day of rest. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, because again, uh, homework one is getting pushed by a day, homework two will be released on Thursday and you'll get two weeks. And uh, homework two it will involve online learning, which we are talking about today, and you'll implement the perceptron algorithm and play with some variants of that. Um, once again, you'll be using cross validation and such things. So all the stuff that you got to explore during homework one will become useful again in homework two and hopefully also in your project. Um, the schedule on the class website will be updated to kind of reflect these changes. Another scheduling point is about projects. Uh, remember that um, there is a project that you have to work on for the semester. And uh, the way this works, and maybe this is a good time for me to. Uh, oh, there is a comment on Canvas. There is, I have feel there is another person who has conflict with every office hours. Uh, so again, uh, email one of us and uh, email all of us, and we'll see if we can figure out some way to accommodate this. I can't guarantee an accommodation, but we'll try. Uh, so send a message on Canvas to uh, all three TAs and me. Uh, both of you and maybe others who may have uh, conflicts with office hours. Um, there is uh, another question is, will there be any office hours, TA hours online? Tomorrow's uh, 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 TA hours are actually online. They will be on Zoom. Uh, I think there was already an announcement on Canvas, right? Yeah. Uh, so it will be the same Canvas link. And uh, if there's any update on that, we will send a message. But as of now, uh, the TARs for Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday noon are uh, online. Um, any other questions about homeworks and office hours before we talk about projects? In person or online? 
I see we have a big online participation today. Bigger than usual. I also see that the class is a lot emptier than usual. Maybe I should stop recording this. Um, <laughs> In any case, um, so uh, let me talk about projects. So the way projects work is you'll be, we'll, we'll create a data set for you, maybe a few variants of the same data set or something like that. And uh, we'll be using Kaggle. Uh, what Kaggle does is it allows you to essentially download a data set and build your model. And there'll be a test set that we you'll be, you'll also download. And you'll, 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 you'll create predictions for all the test examples and upload it and using whatever learning algorithm you want. And uh, Kaggle will kind of grade, not grade you, but essentially grade your learning algorithm. It'll assign, it'll compute accuracy or whatever is the appropriate metric so that we'll decide. And the goal for the project is for you to try out uh, six different learning algorithms on the same data set so that you get a sense of how different algorithms fare. And I'll give you more details as we go along. Uh, the project is structured into a series of milestones. The first milestone, which was originally due on Thursday, is going to be pushed back a week because we are still figuring out some details about your data set. But the first milestone is so simple that it's not going to take you more than 20 minutes. All you have to do is if you already do, if you don't already have a Kaggle account, is to create one. And uh, you'll download the data that we provide unzip the file, find a submission that we create called the dummy submission and upload it to Kaggle. And then on Canvas, tell us what your Kaggle ID is so that we can check. Essentially, it's just a way of uh, to make sure that we get the full sort of uh, pipeline working where you figure out how to upload things, we figure out who you are on Kaggle and such things. But this is gonna be, uh, there'll be more details about this on uh, Canvas. Um, I'm hoping that uh, in the next few days, we'll figure out something about more details about your project. Any questions? Yes. So the, you should not walk around. So to grade you on the project, we're not going to look at, um, uh, so first of all, you have to basically see a, go through a series of milestones. You need to submit, six different algorithms and, they, uh, or, and there'll be a few other criteria. And essentially you need to match all those criteria. Now let's say as a hypothetical, one of the algorithms you choose is uh, the ID3 using a certain set of features. And we know, or we find based on the averages in the class that uh, the ID3 using those features gets, I'm just making a number up, gets 70% accuracy. Now let's say that your implementation of ID3 mysteriously gets 95. That suggests that there's a bug. It's a good bug, but it's still a bug. Or if it gets 50%, both of these are wrong. So essentially, if you're more off by more than say, one or two standard deviations for that particular algorithm and feature choice, you will lose points. I don't care that you get to the top of the leaderboard. What I do want is for you to have the right implementations. And essentially, it's another way for you to essentially uh, test out your implementations and get a sense of what kind of algorithms uh, work in what situations and with what features. Does that make sense? So importantly, your position on the leaderboard does not really matter to me, but you can use it for bra bragging rights and uh, uh, such as it is, yeah. Other questions? Other questions about homeworks? Ah, yes, another question about uh, uh, the homework. For the assignments, would the, is the expected accuracy uh, to be in a range or is it some fixed values? Typically, we expect it to be in a certain range. Um, the reason is there might be some numerical issues with uh, that, that kind of change the, the, the accuracy is just a bit. Or more interestingly and more importantly, as we will see for uh, most algorithms going forward, the learning algorithm will have a element of randomness inside it, which means if you run the same thing twice, and let's say you use one random seed and someone else uses a different random seed, 
you might get slightly different results. Not very different, but slightly different. So we can't really judge you uh, for getting that slight difference purely because of randomness. So we'll expect them. So for example, let's say that your uh, implementation of the perceptron algorithm for um, uh, a certain variant of it gets, I don't know, maybe 63% again. My implementation might get 63.1 or 62.5. So there's like a small window that uh, is permissible uh, and we'll be okay with that. Uh, does that make sense? As you're typing the answer, uh, I'll wait for more questions. Okay, cool. Um, I don't see any more hands raised. I don't see any more uh, messages on um, the chat. So I think we can jump back to our lecture. We're going to continue today on uh, the lecture on online learning. In particular, we are looking at a particular, a specific flavor of online learning called mistake driven or mistake and mistake bound learning. Uh, the general schematic for this protocol for learning is uh, shown on the slide. And we saw this in the last lecture. I want to revisit this. There is a certain, there's a learner. The learner is this box here that internally has a way of making predictions for new examples. What's the, uh, I mean, when I say it has a way for, of making predictions for new examples, just another uh, shorter way of saying that is it has a current hypothesis. It has a hypothesis that can make assign labels to instances, which is lucky because we are given one instance, exactly one instance, one example, and the learner sees that and it makes a certain prediction. So given X, it predicts HT of X. Now, after it makes the prediction and only after it makes the prediction, the true label for the example is revealed to the learner. At this point, the learner could have been right, in which case it does nothing, or it could have been wrong, in which case it uses this as a chance to update its hypothesis from HT to HT plus one. So this is a very, very simple um, um, sort of protocol for interacting with data. There is no need for aggregating data. There is no need for kind of computing statistics over the data over and over again, like you do with ID3. Um, there's no need for uh, a fixed data file. Essentially, the learner is always on. It sees an example, it makes a prediction, and after that, nature reveals the label. So there are really only two things, two uh, processes that uh, or two functions that need to be defined uh, to make this model work. One of them is, how do you make a prediction when a new example comes along? This includes the choice of the hypothesis space and such things. Another one is, if there is a mistake, how does the internal hypothesis get updated? If I define these, these two things, I have defined a complete uh, uh, learner that operates in this mistake-driven uh, protocol. Any questions about this approach, this protocol for learning? This is different, by the way, while you're thinking of questions, this is different from a different uh, another style of learning called batch learning, which is what ID3 does where the learner has access to the entire data set and it can do multiple passes over the data set. It can compute things. It can iterate over the data again and again and such things. It, the batch learner needs memory to store all the examples and do things with it. Online learner does not need anything. It needs enough memory to store one example, the one that's just coming in, to store the hypothesis that it currently has and maybe a little bit of sort of crack space for update and storing the labels and such things. So an online learner is a much more, uh, can operate in a much more uh, uh, efficient way. Did you have a question? Yeah, uh, when you say one example, is that just like one row of a data set? Uh, you can think of it as one row of a data set, yes. My mental model is not organized as rows. I think of it as, uh, uh, you know, it could be like one document if you're classifying documents, one image if you're classifying images, one video if you're classifying videos, or one row if you're classifying rows. So whatever instances are, it is one instance. Other questions? 
Yes. So how does swag play in this example space? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Are we just randomly walking in this example space? In a sense, yes, but in a sense, no. And I'll tell you what I mean. It may seem to the learner that examples are being chosen at random. But in fact, the learner does not get to choose examples at all. Nature chooses what examples should show up. And the learner does not control which example it encounters next. So, for example, nature might be adversarial and decide to somehow always show the hardest example. So, you know, assume that nature has a certain uh, concept in its mind. And it can also see the learner's current hypothesis. And what it does is, given this hypothesis, I'm going to pick an example that guarantees a mistake. It can be adversarial. Nature can be extremely beneficial. What it could do is it could essentially pick an example, show it to the learner, pick the same example, show it to the learner. So the learner sees the same example over and over again till infinity or somewhere in between. So the, the, importantly, neither we who are going to analyze these algorithms, nor the learner who is actually doing the learning here gets to decide on what the sequence of examples is. That's a good question. Other questions? Yes. In a different, that makes the protocol different. In what is in the online learning protocol, the learner does not have the liberty to choose examples. The reason I'm defining this protocol is basically restricting ourselves to these sorts of uh, how the learner interacts with the world allows us to perform some analysis that may not otherwise be possible. It is possible that the learner chooses examples and then makes predictions and then gets the label, but that's active learning, where the learner picks an example to get uh, say supervision on. That's a different protocol for learning, which is much, much harder to actually analyze, it turns out. We don't, we're not going to cover active learning in this class, but uh, the, the, there exists another protocol which does what you just said. Other questions? Yes. Can you speak up? Sorry. Uh, yeah. So um, the question was, is there still a hypothesis space that the learner is searching? And the answer is yes. This belongs to some set. And the update from HT to HT plus one, the update to the hypothesis, is also going to be within that set. It is not going to be necessary. It's not. It doesn't have to be an arbitrarily, uh, arbitrary function. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, in this process, the learner is navigating a hypothesis space. Okay. Uh, good questions, and keep them coming. Uh, yes, one more. No, we are not. The question was: Are we assuming that the true function is in the hypothesis space? And the answer is: We we are not. We are making no assumptions about the true function yet. Here, the, the true function might be completely outside, in which case, every single time we, ever, we might make a mistake, or very often we might make a mistake, and such as life. So the learner might not never get 100%. Uh, but there's no notion of accuracy. We have to decide what it means to be good in this protocol. We haven't yet defined that. So let's get to that question. Now, given this protocol, I'm going to define a set of algorithms. And this is the last thing that I did in the previous lecture, and I want to revisit this. And I remember that someone at the back had a question, and maybe we can go back to that question at the end. So I'm going to define this class of uh, algorithms called mistake bond algorithms. We have an instance space, things that are going to get labeled like documents, images, um, text, videos, and so on. And there is a certain target function f, which is called the concept, which belongs to a set called c. The target function belongs to some set of functions called the concept class. The target function is parameterized by, um, uh, or the concept class, the size of the concept class typically is parameterized by n, the dimensionality here. And we'll see an example of uh, why that happens. Essentially, the size of the, the concept class 
if you can define it to be, if it is a known set, then we might be able to say, how big is this set as a function of the dimensionality? If you have only say two features, there are fewer functions to search. If you have 2 million features, there are more functions to search. There's a question. So in this context, this uh, uh, example here, uh, are we in the same concept class? So like the target function is a member of the concept class. Um, we are assuming the following. We are assuming that maybe X, since I said that it, it has a dimensionality N, let's say that the set X is a subset of the N dimensional real space. And the output is 0 or 1, so it's a binary classifier. So you have a point in some feature space that gets mapped to a true or a false. It's possible that uh, in fact we will actually study uh, today a concrete instance where the instant space is actually a boolean so it's an n dimensional boolean vector and the reason we do that is because we can actually make some very concrete statements with that particular set which is also we as of now we are not assuming anything other than the fact that the output is a zero or a one it's a binary classifier and the dimensionality is n. Well, we are not assuming that the dimensionality is n. Whatever the dimensionality is, we are calling it n. Okay. Now, the learning protocol, which we just saw as a schematic, I've written it here in text. The learner is given an example that is randomly chosen by nature. The learner predicts its current, uh, uh, it uses its current hypothesis to make a prediction. It predicts h of x. And then it's uh, the true label f of x is revealed to the learner. This is the feedback that the learner receives. Now, the question is, what does it mean to succeed in this mode of learning? Every time the learner gets an input and makes a prediction, if its prediction is right, we count it as a success. If its prediction is wrong, it's a mistake. So, when h of x is not equal to f of x, then there's something that went wrong in the learner's internal conceptualization, right? Which means the learner has the opportunity to adapt itself, correct itself. But in a perfect world, we would like the learner to stop making mistakes. So in a perfect world, every time a new example comes in, f of, it makes a prediction, the learner makes a prediction f of h of x, Nature reveals the true label and it finds that the true label is correct, the, its prediction is correct. If this happens forever, then we could, in a certain manner of speaking, probably agree that the learner has learned the concept. It stops making mistakes given the sequence of examples that it's going to encounter. So that's, that's our definition of success here. The learning succeeds if the learner stops making mistakes. Now, which, which means that the quantity to keep track of in defining the success of our learner is simply the number of mistakes given a certain sequence of examples. Right? Does that make sense? The learner has presented a sequence of examples and the goal is count how many of them, how many examples did this learner make a mistake on? So I'm going to define this quantity. Um, don't worry about the notation yet. Uh, let's focus on what it means. So there is a certain algorithm, A, the learning algorithm. The learning algorithm is defined by how the update happens and how the prediction happens. And it is for a particular sequence of examples, which we will call S, and for a particular target function F, we can count how many mistakes the learner makes. That quantity, I'm giving it the name, M A, of f comma s. So for this particular target function, for this particular sequence of uh, examples, the learner A makes these many mistakes. If the target function is changed, maybe the mistakes will change. Maybe, the, uh, maybe if the uh, sequence of examples is changed, the mistakes, number of mistakes could change. But what is, a, in, what is important here is we, uh, or the learner, does not get to control what sequence of examples shows up. The learner also does not get to control what the target function is. Neither of these things are in the learner's hands. 
right? So imagine that nature decides to be a jerk and picks the hardest concept uh, to learn. So the concept class C contains many functions. So let's say C is F0. Let's say the concept class contains Let's just, so let's say the concept class contains 100 functions. And maybe the hardest function to learn according to the number of mistakes because the or the nature knows the true uh, behavior of the learner, maybe F1 is the hardest function, to, uh, function in the set according to uh, the number of mistakes. And maybe for F1, there may be some sequence of examples, right? I mean, you have, the learner is presented with a sequence of examples. Maybe there's a certain sequence. Uh, I've used up N, right? There is a certain sequence. Let's say, let's call this S. This particular sequence of examples is the absolute worst for that function. For that function, that particular sequence of examples is the one that forces the learner to make the maximum number of mistakes. The only thing we get to control is what the algorithm is. There are three uh, uh, things highlighted in that statement. There's the algorithm A, there's the, the true function F, and the sequence of examples S. And among these three, the only thing we get to control in designing a learning algorithm is what A is. So imagine that for a particular algorithm, we can ask, what's the maximum number of mistakes that that algorithm makes for a concept class for uh, for any function in the concept class. So for the most difficult function in the concept class, and for the most difficult sequence of examples for that particular function. Essentially, the worst case for number of mistakes. It's an interesting quantity. It's the absolute worst that this learning algorithm can do in terms of performance. It's an interesting quantity, and it's interesting enough to give it um, a symbol. M A of C. It's a property of that particular concept class and that particular algorithm. Now, it's a now this quantity here. If we kind of make an assumption that the concept class is some set, this quantity here can tell us something interesting about the algorithm. If this quantity is infinite for a certain concept class, that means this algorithm will never learn that concept. Any any function from that concept. Or, or there exists at least one function in the concept class, the hardest one, that can cause this learner to fail. Before I move on, any questions about these two quantities? Yes. Um, I'm just thinking why that is a number of S in the maps. Uh, that is because this is a mistake. This whole thing, um, it, you should remind me later, I'll correct it. This is so wrong. <laughs> I'll write it more correctly here. So you pick the hardest function and the worst sequence of examples and count how many mistakes you make. Can't believe I let that go for this. Good catch. This has been in the slides for years now. <laughs> okay. Uh, other questions? So MA of C is the hardest, uh, uh, is the, in some sense, the maximum possible number of mistakes that the algorithm A makes for any function in C for any sequence of examples. Now imagine that for a particular algorithm and for a particular concept class, I can say, I'm able to say that I can, the, the, I can tell nature, do your worst, I'll still be fine. So imagine that I'm able to prove formally that no matter which sequence of examples nature picks, and no matter which function the true function is, the number of mistakes that a particular learner is going to make is going to be bounded. It's only polynomial. Polynomial in 
uh, those of you who may not be familiar with theory speak, polynomial just means small. So if the number of functions is only polynomial in the dimensionality, then that counts as a win. If I can prove it, I mean, I have not said that maybe there are no algorithms that satisfy that property. But if a certain algorithm has that property, that even the worst case number of mistakes is still only polynomial in the dimensionality, that should count as a win. Now, why is polynomial in the dimensionality interesting? Any thoughts, any questions? Why, wh what makes, wh why is the statement that being polynomial in the dimensionality is small? Valid. Yes. It's something like that. Yeah. Right. So polynomial is less than exponential. Do people agree on that first? I see uh, two or three heads nodding. One more. Okay. So I'm assuming there are, I saw five heads nodding. I'm going to just scale it up by 16 and assume the entire class agrees. Uh, polynomial functions are a lower order of magnitude, lower complexity class than exponential functions. Now, given a, 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 a Boolean function, let's pretend that we are working with Boolean function. If we have a Boolean function with n features, the number of rows in the truth table is 2 power n, right? Now, the maximum number of examples that nature should be can be forced to reveal is the entire truth table every row in the truth table. So if you have, this is worth a new page. So if you have n equals three, then you have, there are eight rows in the truth table, which is two cubes, so two power three. So in general, you have two power n rows in the truth table. And uh, this is pretty much the entire uh, re revealing a row would reveal uh, the label for that row. So let's call this, and this is a zero or a one or whatever. So every row that nature is forced to reveal reveals one new bit of information to the learner. The maximum number of rows that nature can be forced to reveal is two power eight, two power three, because there are only those many rows in the truth table. So there are only those many unique feature combinations. If my learning algorithm is successful according to the way that I define, instead of having nature reveal two power n algorithms, uh, two power n rows, it starts succeeding with only a polynomial of n. And two power n is much bigger than the polynomial. So even without having to see the entire truth table, the learner can certify that it will never make mistakes in the future. Remember, when I told you at the beginning of the semester, learning might be impossible if learning should be treated as impossible if the only way to learn is seeing the entire, every possible combination of features. And this uh, definition that I just gave you is just saying with only a polynomial number of mistakes, the learner can uh, learn the true function without having, having to make a mistake on every possible uh, feature combination. Any questions, any thoughts, any suggestions, comments? Yes. Um, why are you looking at the learning that makes the max number of mistakes instead of the So the question was, why, why do we care about the maximum possible number of mistakes rather than the least? Because the order in which the examples are going to be presented is not controlled by the learner. So in the worst case, nature might choose the particular sequence of examples that forces it to keep making mistakes. So we need to essentially consider this, any sort of statement we make needs to consider that one sequence. Because if we, if we look at the least, we are essentially considering the sequence of examples and the function that most favors the learner. But we are considering that we, in order to make a statement, we are in order to say anything about uh, what we don't control, 
we are assuming, oh, what we don't control is the worst possible thing, is going to take the worst possible form. And let's now see what happens in that case. And even in that case, if the number of mistakes is only polynomial, we call such an algorithm, a mistake bound algorithm for that particular concept class. Question, yes. Uh, you define mistakes in a different way. You can uh, define mistakes by, uh, you know, deviations from the ground truth and such things. If it's, uh, I mean, I can define it whatever I, however I want, right? So, to kind of uh, answer your question, notice that I have just defined a set here. All I have said is an algorithm that satisfies this property is called a mistake bound algorithm. I've just defined an algorithm to be a mistake bound algorithm, but I've not told you whether such a thing is even possible. Right? Maybe all I have done here is to define an empty set. I mean, of course I've not, because otherwise the rest of the lecture is just me staring at you. Uh, but I could have defined a, a vacuous concept here, but in fact, it turns out we'll see that it's not. For regression, I have to think about it. I have to look it up actually whether uh, so what the formal definition of that is, because most of the time this sort of mistake bound learning is defined in terms for classification. Other questions? This is just a, um, this, this sort of an algorithm that I've uh, said, again, I want to re restate that point that I just made. I have not given you even a single example of a mistake bound algorithm yet. I've defined something to have this property. I could have defined a mistake bound algorithm as an algorithm that um, you know, makes zero mistakes because it gets the right label even without seeing any training data. It just magically knows the concept. I could have defined such an algorithm. It would be an empty set. There is no such algorithm, right? So I've defined this, this, say, this set of algorithms here. And maybe this doesn't exist, but um, it's it's an interesting thing to worry uh, to study to think about. Because if such an algorithm exists, then the maximum number of mistakes it, that particular algorithm will make for any function in the concept class, even for adversarially chosen functions, for any sequence of examples that it sees, even for adversarially chosen sequences of examples. The maximum number of mistakes is going to be polynomial. It's small. Now, this is a property of an algorithm. This is about an algorithm and a concept class. So the pair of um, A and C. Now, let's say that you have a certain concept class, say uh, the set of all linearly separable concepts, like we saw for uh, linear classifiers. The set of every concept that there is for which there exists some linear classifier. We could ask, does there exist a mistake bound learner, a mistake bound algorithm for that set? A concept, a concept class, C, is said to be learnable under the mistake bound model if there exists at least one algorithm that makes only a polynomial number of mistakes for the uh, adversarially chosen sequence of examples. So, once again, the polynomial is polynomial in the dimensionality. So the thing on top is saying that an algorithm is a mistake bound algorithm for a particular concept class. The block at the bottom is asking, is saying, a concept class is said to be learnable under this particular model of learnability if there exists an algorithm. Maybe I don't even know what the algorithm is. If I can prove that there exists an algorithm that satisfies the property, then the concept class is learnable. This is, yes. Concept class is that going to be your data sets you're going to use? No. So, okay, uh, good question. A concept class is the set of functions, not data sets and images are about instances, right? Or images are instances, data sets are about a pairs of instance, comma, label. A concept class is a set of functions. It's a set of functions that we believe nature has decided to pick its function from. 
it's essentially the theoretical uh, object which we never have access to it's mostly for uh, uh, understanding what are the limits of this particular approach or that particular uh, algorithm or this style of learning as we will see certain concept classes concept classes are sets of functions certain concept classes are cannot be learned at all and certain concept classes can be learned under this model yes uh, that's a very good observation. Uh, the question is, do we need to make sure that when we are thinking about a certain concept class, we, our learner is exploring a hypothesis space such that it contains the concept class. Otherwise, how can we possibly learn the function? If our learner is searching a set of functions that does not contain the true answer, what's the point? Uh, for theoretical purposes, at least for now, we will make that assumption. Later on, when we talk about uh, what's called agnostic learning, we will drop that assumption and kind of see how bad can things get. When the learner might be searching a set of functions, which does not even contain the true set, the true function. So essentially, it, uh, the true function is somewhere there, and the learner is searching this set and hoping to find it. And then, how bad can it be? And that's a more natural thing, because we don't know what the true function is for, say, uh, uh, mathematically, I don't know how to write down a function for, say, uh, uh, whether an image contains a cat or not. It's a complicated thing. So I'm going to search a set of functions that I can search. So how bad can that get? For now, we are going to uh, work with the easier assumption that uh, we know what the concept class is. Yes. Oh, there's a question on Zoom. Um, if such an algorithm exists, does all function do all functions in the concept class give a good accuracy because none of them makes more than those many mistakes. So the, que the question saying, if let's say such, um, this algorithm exists, or maybe here, this algorithm exists. And can we say that every uh, concept in this concept class will give you, uh, can be learned with good accuracy? Note that the game here is not about getting good accuracy. We don't care about accuracy. We only care about stopping the number of mistakes. This is essentially the learner operating in an infinite loop. It's very different from how we deploy algorithms today. But imagine that there's a learner that's operating in an infinite loop. Once it stops making mistakes, and once we can prove mathematically that it stops making mistakes, we are done. It, there is going to be no more mistakes. Essentially, it's going to have 100% accuracy after it crosses that threshold. And all we are saying is that that threshold is going to happen quickly. So accuracy is not the, uh, the point of this, uh, this protocol. Instead, the protocol of uh, this protocol of learning demands that all it demands is that the learner stops making mistakes. So it's not just about accuracy. Other questions? By the way, this is not the most general setting for what's called online learning. Mistake bond model or mistake bond learning is a special case. Uh, and the, the counting the number of mistakes is not the most general uh, metric for success. In the literature, I'll get you in a minute, you might find other metrics for the more general uh, uh, family of online learning, uh, which have all these cool names like regret or what's called cumulative loss. Uh, we will not cover that in this class, but regret is just another way of asking. After my entire, after my learner encounters a sequence of examples, in hindsight, having seen the entire thing, could it have done any better? And cumulative loss is what's the total number of, uh, what's the related to your, the comment? It's a generalization of mistake. Mistake is either it's right or wrong. The loss could be almost right or almost wrong and you, you accumulate that quantity. And we can generalize online learning to other such settings. Uh, I mean, online learning includes other such metrics. In this class, we'll only talk about the mistake bond model because, well, it's simple. Um, uh, and it's kind of, it already has a lot of the interesting properties that I want you to think about. 
question. Yeah, this might just be a quick question, but um, the like the if we were able to like the number of state has to be a problem, but we were able to do all do the loop that makes the function or has the function with with the correction and stuff, or is it like so it's not accuracy, but like the number of the states that you know? So I'll give you an example. So it's, so you say quickly, and it's a little confusing to me because maybe I'll, uh, that suggests I just buy the newest computer and it gets better. Uh, it's not exactly that. So the way this works is, uh, imagine that my learner uh, starts off with some initial hypothesis H0, okay? And it encounters an example X, X, let's call it X0, and it makes a prediction H0 of X0. Then let's say this, let's say this is uh, one. And then nature comes along and says, oh, the true label is a zero. So at this point, H zero gets in changes to H one. And now a new example comes along. Let's call that X one. Uh, I should not be using, yeah, let's call it X one. And it the, the, the learner makes a prediction using its current hypothesis. So it will have H one of X. X1, let's say this is a zero, and nature comes along and says, this is a zero. There's nothing to do because there was no mistake. And then you have H1 again for the next round. So learning proceeds in these rounds. So the next round, H1 is retained, X2 comes along, and let's say uh, this prediction is one, nature says, no, it's a zero. At this point, it makes an update. So the thing of interest here is how often does this update happen? In the middle step, there was no change. And that can that doesn't matter. So it's not the quickness, but essentially just the mistakes. Yes. Explain, what do you mean by that? Um, Okay. Why do you think it's overfitting? Can, uh, I think I know what you're saying, but I want you to kind of say it a little more explicitly. And let, but remember, we don't have a fixed set of examples here. The learner essentially continues to infinity. The 101st data point might make the learner fail. So there is no fixed data set. Instead, imagine that the learner is operating in an infinite loop and keeps encountering new examples, keeps encountering examples. Maybe it sees the same example again and again, or maybe new ones, but it see, keeps encountering examples. Now, yes? Yes. It's, it goes to infinity. There is nothing called training and testing here. There is literally infinite, infinitely long learning, but hopefully only a finite number of mistakes. That's the interesting part here. Despite encountering examples like till infinity, after making a certain number of mistakes, if it's if you have a theorem that says it will not make any more, it doesn't matter. Good question. That's going to occupy us for the rest of today. Yes. We can't control the sequence. We need to consider the worst case. So we need to, any theorem that we prove about mistake bound cannot make any assumptions about the sequence of examples. In this semester, you will encounter at least two mistake bound algorithms two or three, two. One of them is a conceptual thing that is just there as a proof of concept. And one of them is something that you will implement in your homeworks. We'll, we'll see that uh, as we go along. In the interest of time, I want to move on and uh, you know keep your questions uh, and you know we can, maybe I'm going to answer some of your questions as we go along. So, Online learning, which is the generalization of mistake-bound learning, 
makes no assumption about the distribution of examples. And this is something that I've said a few times now. The examples could be adversarially chosen, but it doesn't really matter. In online learning, every single online learning algorithm operates in the same way. The learner gets an unlabeled example, it makes a prediction, and then either the true label is revealed, which we can use for mistake bound, or the more general version is um, a, a measure of uh, error is revealed to the uh, to the learner. In the mistake bound model, we count the number of mistakes. In online learning, we might count other things. The thing about this particular model of learning is it's so simple. It's so simple. Like most of you, at least the ones who have been asking questions, are asking me questions assuming that it is more complicated than it is. There's a the thing about training and test set. Nothing of that sort. Maybe there are, there's a fixed set of examples. Nothing of that sort. There's just a, a, these three steps goes on till infinity. And despite it being simple, it's actually, it has a practical use. It might be helpful if your uh, learner operates on a massive data set. Imagine that you have a data set that is so big that uh, it cannot fit in your memory. It's so big that it cannot fit in your, uh, you can't even store it in your hard disk. All you can do is just let the example stream through and your learner makes its own corrections. In terms of evaluation, the goal is we want to make the smallest number of mistakes in the long run in you know as the learner keeps going on it, see it, that's also a very simple sort of uh, a sort of a natural i claim it's a natural way to measure success now the real goal of learning though from lecture number one is not about making mistakes or such things it's about generalization the goal is for the learner to do well on previously unseen examples I would like you to think about what this protocol of learning, how it connects to that true goal. And also think about, you know, can online learning eventually get, if I give you like a mistake bound algorithm, can it eventually get to a, a, a hypothesis that uh, will do well on unseen data? I'm not gonna answer those questions. I want you to think about them offline. Uh, speaking of offline and online, the word online and online learning predates the popularity of the word online as in on the internet. It has nothing to do with that. It's just there is an algorithm that is always on. The, the, the online or mistake bound model of learning is a worst case model because it does not make any assumptions about how the data is distributed. There is no memory uh, it's in some sense the simplest uh, model for memory bound uh, settings. The advantage is that it's simple. And many of the interesting sort of learnability questions that we can think about whether this class of functions is learnable or not, many of those questions already show up in the online model. And if you have, if you give me an online algorithm, we'll talk about this later. Uh, if you give me an online algorithm, there's a standard way to convert it into what's called a batch mode, where you can take an online algorithm and convert it into a setting that operates on your standard training and test type uh, setup. So there's a standard online to batch conversion. Unfortunately, it's, uh, uh, there is one sort of a complication with online learning, which, or at least mistake uh, driven learning, that makes things hard. We can, all we can say, if, if suppose I tell you that a certain mistake, uh, certain algorithm is a mistake bound algorithm. Not only do I say it's a mistake bound algorithm, let's say I tell you that this algorithm will make no more than 100 mistakes. Okay. And, you know, let's say your dimensionality is big enough that this is good. It will make no more than 100 mistakes, but it does not tell you when those 100 mistakes will happen. Maybe the 100 mistakes will happen the first hundred times you see an example, or maybe you make a mistake every hundred million, million, million uh, uh, predictions. So you have to see so many predictions before you complete the budget of hundred mistakes. Maybe those hundred mistakes will happen at a very inconvenient time. Imagine a self-driving car 
that comes with a mistake bound that says it can make exactly 100 mistakes while driving. I'm not going to tell you when those accidents are going to happen. You won't buy that car. I won't. Um, so it, it, it makes no distributional assumptions, which is a strength, but it's also kind of a complication. Another complication is uh, uh, if nature decides to show you the same example again and again, that's a perfectly valid sequence, right? It sees, you see one example, make a prediction, get some feedback, correct yourself. Then nature says, oh, you know, I've shown you this example. I'm going to show it to you again. See the example, make a prediction. Hopefully don't make a mistake uh, and keep going on. Nature keeps showing you the same example again and again. And it will seem like the model has converged because no mistakes are made. But you've only seen one example. You've seen one example infinite number of times. Does this mean that you've learned the concept? What if the distribution of the data is such that you, that's the only example that exists? Does that mean that you've learned the concept? So it's a tricky question to answer. Uh, I've seen both answers and both uh, yes and no are justifiable here. So that's the, this is the point that I was just making about. Suppose nature uh, presents the same example open, uh, over and over again. Under the mistake bond model, this is okay. You stop making mistakes, you're done. But uh, if you want to take that particular learner and take it to a different uh, domain where the distribution of examples changes, then it could be problematic. But today, we're not going to concern ourselves about such things. Okay. Uh, there were a lot of questions about this. So I'm going to kind of quickly, I'm not going to pause for questions because I want to move on. Um, what I would like to do now is talk about uh, whether there can exist, there can exist any algorithm that is a mistake bond algorithm. All I did was to say, if an algorithm has a certain property for a certain concept class, then it's a mistake bond algorithm. I did not present, I did not show you any such thing. I could be talking about a non-existent algorithm. Just to kind of dispel all such doubts, let me present a proof of concept. An algorithm called halving, that is a mistake bound algorithm for Boolean functions. So can mistake bound algorithms exist? The answer is yes. There's at least one mistake bound algorithm in the universe called the halving algorithm. As you will see, it's a terrible algorithm. But it's a mistake bound algorithm. It's a terrible algorithm for other computational reasons. Let's uh, let's kind of see this in two stages. First, I'll present a different algorithm, not having, but another algorithm called con, which will stop making mistakes, but it's not a great algorithm. And then I'll slightly edit it and show you the having algorithm, which is um, which will stop making mistakes and is also a mistake bound algorithm. So let's say that we have a concept class C. Importantly, C is a finite concept class. And uh, so you can think of it as like the set of Boolean functions or maybe a subset of Boolean functions, like all Boolean functions that are conjunctions. Did you have a question? Okay. All Boolean functions that are conjunctions. And the goal is to learn some function inside that set. I'll define this algorithm called con. Con is short for consistent. Remember, to define a mistake bond uh, or a, a mistake driven algorithm, I need to tell you two things. How does the mistake driven algorithm make predictions on the new example? And second, if there's a mistake, how does it correct itself? So what it does is uh, in every round of this algorithm, internally, this algorithm has a list of every function inside the set that is that agrees with all the examples it has seen so far. So initially it starts off with the entire set. Let's say it sees this. This is a set of functions. C1, C2, C100. Let's say this set is the set C, the set of all functions that exist. I should not be calling it C1. Let's use the same notation that I've used. I have a set F0, F1, F99. These 99 functions are the, the only functions that can exist for uh, this, the, as far as we are concerned. 
And at any point of time during learning, the learner only keeps that subset of this, this set, uh, the, uh, this, uh, these hundred functions that agree with the previously seen examples. Maybe F0 does not agree with the first instance. F0 says that the first example that we encountered was a label zero, but the first nature said the first example was label one. So F0 gets discarded. Every time you encounter an example that uh, disagrees with nature, you just discard it. So you only keep the sub, you keep a shrinking subset of this set that uh, agrees with everything that has been seen so far. When a new example comes in, I need to define how to make a prediction. What Khan does is it picks one function randomly from all the functions that we still have in play and uses that to make a prediction. And that's it. The update is if it makes a mistake, you get it of that you get it of all functions that are uh, that disagree with the prediction. Otherwise, you keep it and you you, you change nothing. I claim that at every step, the set C i plus one is going to be a subset of the set C i. Can someone who's either ask me questions or tell me why this is true? Someone who's not spoken up so far. Yeah. Constructed, like CI plus one is constructed by the intermediate stuff of CI. So anything in CI plus one is constructed by multiplying. That's right. The way CI plus one is constructed is you need that set to be consistent with all the previous examples. So to go from CI, let's say there are two cases here, right? So case one is no mistake. If there's no mistake, if in, in if meaning the randomly chosen function f made a correct prediction, then you make no change because there was remember no mistake means there is no change that happens in this model. So no mistake, then c i plus one is equal to c i. And case two, if there is a mistake, then you c i plus one is all the functions, and I'm not going to write this because this is going to be a lot. CI plus one will contain all those functions in CI, which made the which predicted the correct label on this example. So there were some functions inside this CI plus one that made a mistake, at least one because the randomly chosen function made a mistake. So at least one thing will get removed. At least one function will in CI must have made a mistake for there to be a mistake. So at least that one function will be removed and maybe others as well. Yes. Are we, so you say at least one, but there's a function that's not checking all of them every single time, right? Or is it, are we only checking one? Ah, that's a good point. So the question is, if you want to keep, maintain this property that the set is consist only consists of those functions that are uh, consistent with examples. At every step, you need to enumerate every function and see, did you make a mistake? If yes, then you toss it out. Did you make a mistake? If no, then keep it for the next round. So you need to enumerate every function in every round in order to uh, uh, construct that subset. Yes. I don't have a good answer for that other than this is uh, only to show you a contrast for the next thing. Okay. This is to, it's essentially a tool, a pedagogical tool. This is, this algorithm is not the one that I'm going to advertise as the, you know, the best thing out there. It's there mostly to tell you, yeah, you could do this, but very clearly you could have done better. <laughs> so importantly, if the i plus one, if, if the random function that we chose, the random representative that we chose to predict the label in this round made a mistake, then c i plus one 
will at least lose that one function, which means the size of CI plus one is strictly less than the size of CI. Progress is made. Why? Because we had a finite set of functions to begin with. And every time there's a mistake, we are tossing out at least one function. We have a finite set of functions, which means there are at most a finite number of mistakes. Right? We, where we, in the worst case, we toss out one function at a time. How many mistakes can Con make in the worst case? Someone who's not, yes. It's the number of functions minus one. There is one function, we are assuming there is one function inside the concept class that is correct. And assume that nature is adversarial. Nature wants to force you to make as many mistakes as possible. So it will pick examples, it will orchestrate things so that only that one function that you pick as the random representative is the mistake. And uh, every time there's a mistake, you lose one function. So you start off with the number of functions you start off with is size of C. In every round, you lose one function. And eventually we need to have one left, right? Because there was a true answer. There was one function that's never going to make a mistake. Learning stops when we get to that function. So there are size of C minus one bad function in the set. And nature can force you to essentially reveal, uh, you know, drop only one at each step. So this is the number of mistakes that Con can make. So the maximum number of mistakes it can make is size of C minus one. Any question about this curious algorithm? Yeah. Uh, I think the same question also showed up in uh, uh, Zoom is the size of C two power n. Um, actually, it's much worse than that. Um, it's in the worst case. Imagine that you have Boolean functions. If your, if this concept class is Boolean, then, and you have n features, how many Boolean functions are there to have n features? We've talked about this a few lectures ago. There's one answer, but I want, I'm, I'm trying to not hear your voice. Uh, someone else maybe. Yeah. One option is two to the n, but really there are, you know, two to the n rows in the truth table. How many different ways can you fill in? How, how many different ways can you have, you know, every column here is a different function. How many different functions can exist if you have two to the n rows? Some of you are murmuring the answer. Uh, can you raise your hand and just say it? The answer is 2 power, 2 power n. Also uh, from Zoom, 2 power, 2 power n. And now think about it. I have a set of functions. That set has 2 power, 2 power n objects. And I come to you with an algorithm that says, this algorithm is amazing. It can make no more than 2 power, Two power n minus one mistakes. <laughs> I'll get laughed out. But that's the point. This algorithm is not particularly great for other reasons beyond the obvious. Is this a mistake bound algorithm? Well, it depends on what C is. On the other hand, imagine instead of the set of functions being all uh, Boolean functions, if I had a very, very small set of functions. I carefully construct a set of functions so that there are only n possible functions if you have n features. Then you can, number of mistakes is n minus one. n minus one is polynomial in n. So if the set of functions is small, this algorithm is mistake bound. Yeah. Well, that's literally what this is doing. This is like linear search in a, a list. It's looking at each function and saying, are you good? Are you good? Are you good? 
That's literally what it is. This is, in fact, I want you to, the, the, the connection to linear search of a list is not just me saying something accidentally. It is like linear search. Because the complexity of the search in a list, worst case, is also O of n, if you have n elements. Okay. In the 10 minutes that are left, I'm going to introduce an improved version of this thing. <clears throat> An incredible improvement that takes you from a linear number of mistakes to a logarithmic number of mistakes. Those of you who are, who are thinking list search and thinking binary search, you are not too far off. It's called the halving algorithm. Imagine that you have a concept class C. Just like before, this concept class is a finite concept class. Our goal is to learn this function f inside C that we don't know what it is. The mental image I want you to think about is we have a list of functions. There is one element that we want to find. And learning again proceeds in rounds. It's a mistake driven algorithm. In the first iteration, I'm going to create the set C0, just like with halving, that the, that the initial set is a set of all possible functions. So C0 is equal to C. Just like with uh, sorry, just like with con. Just like before, we're going to construct a series of functions as we go along, a series of subsets of this function, of this original set, as we go along, till there's only one element left. And when there's only one element left, we have to be right because there was one, one correct function and we found it. The clever bit here is how we construct the series of functions. What we do is we need to make a prediction. Given a new instance, when a new example comes in, we need to make a prediction. What we do is we ask every element of the surviving set of functions to make a prediction. And whatever is the majority label, that's going to be presented to, as the label, as the prediction. If you have 100 functions, 70 of them say 0, 30 of them say 1, the prediction is 0. Now. So essentially, I've just written that here in uh, math. If the number of functions that predict a one is greater than the number of predictions that predict a zero, then we predict a one. Let's say now our prediction was wrong. So we had 100 functions, 70 of them said zero, 30 of them say one. So we say zero because it's the majority and our prediction was wrong. The ground truth comes in and it's one. What we do is we discard all the elements in the set that made a mistake. So we drop the 70 and we keep the 30. So we keep only those elements alive that agree with the ground truth. How many mistakes will having make? I've already given you the answer, but I want you to justify the answer. Yes. Log base to the size of C and Y. Every time you make a mistake, what happens is we have dropped the majority. We've dropped at least half of the functions because half of the functions made the, the mistake in prediction because we picked the majority label. So every time there's a mistake, that's, a, that, that's the right answer. Every time there's a mistake, we drop at least half. So this tries every update shrinks the existing set by at least half. So I can say that um, let's maybe build this up from the other end. Suppose we make n mistakes. Now notice here that I'm kind of abusing notation. In this case, n is the number of mistakes. It's not the dimensionality. In this con in this slide, n is the number of mistakes. Now, suppose n, we make n mistakes. Let's start off with the end. In the end, learning stops when exactly one function is left. So we have a set. Oh, we have a set C n that has only one element, the true function. C n was constructed by removing at least half the elements of a previous set called C n minus one. Why? Because in Cn minus one, there was 
a majority of the function made a mistake and it got uh, all of them got removed till because and we were left with only one function so cn minus 1 must be at least double the size of cn maybe more because maybe more things uh, uh, predicted the majority lib so we can say that cn is less than half of cn minus 1 but then we can ask how was cn minus 1 constructed well cn minus 1 was constructed from some cn minus 2 in so there was a cn minus 2 which was a set of functions let's say this was uh, f0 f some set of functions f0 f1 till fk and more than half of them let's say this is uh, more than half more than half of them predicted a certain label which was wrong and so to go from cn minus 2 to cn minus 1 all of these got eliminated so let's call this fi and you have fi to fk all the mistakes were eliminated and this is greater than half so this quantity is more than half so cn minus 2 should be at least twice as big as cn minus 1 I can keep doing this. Cn minus 3 must be at least twice as big as Cn minus 2 and so on, all the way till the initial point. We have n steps here because n mistakes. Every time we have a mistake, we are cutting the set of functions that we are considering by at least half. And so we have, in, at, at the very beginning, we have uh, 1 over 2 power n because if we are multiplying by half again and again. 1 over 2 power n times the original, the size of the original set C0, but C0 was actually the full set of functions C. So we have uh, the this inequality that we can combine, and we just say that the size of the set should be should have over 2 power n elements. So they must be greater than or equal to here. Uh, all of these are, let's say, equal to. Um, the size of C must be over. 2 power n. Well, I can take log on both sides and I say that uh, uh, n should be less than log of the size of c. n was the number of mistakes. So the halving algorithm has to make, it cannot make more than log of the size of c number of mistakes. Any thoughts, any comments, any questions? And by the way, here log is log to the base 2 because we have a 2 power n here. Yes. Can you? It is it the same. The way we are predicting is what's different. We, in one case, in con, we picked a random function and used it as the representative. In halving, we are taking the majority vote. That's the only difference. There was a question. Yes. Yes. Well, we're not searching over. We are asking every. Remember, this is the uh, online learning setup where we don't know the true label. An example comes in. So the way this, how this works is an example comes in and we ask every element we have, every function we have, what's the label on this example? And we count is the number of ones more than the number of zero. If the number of ones is more than the number of zero, then we predict a one. Otherwise, we predict a zero. So we ask the label, but we do not know what the true label is until we have made a prediction. We don't know what we are searching for until we make a prediction. We don't get any feedback. Yes? In the case where uh, the majority is correct, then the number of functions still stays the same. If the, oh, that's a, the, this is a good uh, clarification. What happens when the number of, if the, if the majority label is correct? Well, remember, in the mistake driven setup, if the prediction is correct, we do nothing. If the prediction is correct, 
it doesn't matter. And in, in this chain of inequalities does not really matter because we are only making updates whenever there's a mistake. We are counting the number of mistakes. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, if you like, give, give examples where there's only one, like only one thing that's in one, like the path of the or, or because you can put an example such that only one, 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 one. you have to no, not really. No, that's <laughs> fine. Um, is uh, why, why is why is it always half? Because the reason it's half is because we ask for the prediction step is done by the majority. At least half the functions should have predicted a certain label for the label to be the uh, prediction. So that that's that's how we get a majority. Okay, um, I'm going to stop here. The next lecture, I'm going to re kind of talk about applying this halving algorithm for things, various al various concept classes. And if time permits, we'll start with uh, the perceptron algorithm. Don't forget your homework. I have office hours at two. Uh, feel free to drop in.